at a portion I looked at last week. I'm going to finish it off tonight. It's James chapter 5. James chapter 5. The last time I was preaching on a revival, I think I spoke from James chapter 5. And I'll come in at uh, verse 13. And I'll come in at verse 14. Verse 14 of James chapter 5, a very well-known portion of the Word of God. So James chapter 5. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, but let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and, he, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias for Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not in the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth brought forth. Fruit. Amen. And God will bless to us a reading of his word. And the reason I'm going on to this, if you think just before I go on to speaking to this, in the letters to the churches when the Apostle Paul wrote many of the epistles which you read often, the Apostle Paul is praying often, you see a short burst of prayer for the Apostle Paul, many of them, and he's praying much that God's people would know the blessing of God. We know the blessing of God in our life and that they would be a blessing to others and that's what he's praying for. And here we are 2,000 years later and we read these prayers and we just pray these prayers will be effective and even our prayers as we pray for each other will be effective. Now some of his prayers, I'll just read them out, you don't have to read them up, some of his prayers will be mostly from Ephesians. It says in Ephesians 1 and 18, a very well known uh, prayer of Paul's, Speaking to the church, he says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, but you know that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And he also says in Ephesians 3 and 16, again praying for the church, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with all might by his spirit in the inner man. And in verse 18, he says, and may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. You see, God did, uh, Paul did not cease to pray for the church, that they might be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's what we really pray for tonight. We're praying that the fullness of God will descend, descend upon each and every one of us, and will descend upon this city. And when we read these portions of Scripture, we say, well, did the demand of God, the Apostle Paul's prayers, touch us? Yes, must have touched us. We're gathered here to pray for revival. We're gathered here to pray for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Paul had a great compassion even on the believers. And I pray tonight we have a great compassion upon the unconverted, upon the people out in that city of ours, out in that nation of ours. So I'll go on what we spoke about the last time in verse 17 of James 5. It says, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not in earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. What a prayer. Seven, three and a half years without rain, and then he prayed. And he also prayed a man on top of Mount Carmel. He prayed that the fire of God would descend and burn up the sacrifice, and God heard his prayer. You know, it was a, one thing we looked at last time. Elijah was a man. 
And I'm going to emphasize that again. He was a man subject to like passions as you and I. He prayed that God would withhold rain, a man, and then that God would send rain, a man prayed these things, and God heard the man, and God hears men. He hears men, weak men, men with their faults, with their failings, which you know, see later on when we look at the heroes of faith, they had many faults and failings, but they're still called the heroes of faith because God heard their cries, God heard their prayers, and God answered their prayers. Remember, I mentioned how John the Baptist, again, in Matthew 11 and 13, it says, John the Baptist, 1 and 13, John, John was a man of God. He was a man sent from God. But he was also a man who had weaknesses because, again, in Matthew 11 and 3, was one I thought to, meant to mention, it was a man whose faith waned a bit. Because remember when he sent his disciples to ask, is this the Christ or should we wait for another? Now he had been preaching that Christ would come. He had pointed his finger and says, Behold the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. And yet a time came in his life and a time of weakness when he was in jail. Something happened. There was a bit of weakness. It was only a man. And for a moment he doubted. But he was still a man of God. He was still a mighty man of God. And also the incident in the Damascus Road in Acts chapter 9, and after Paul's conversion, remember after Paul's conversion, when he had been struck blind by the Lord, it says in verse 10 of Acts 9, that Ananias was to go, he was get a word from God, to go to the house of Judas and ask for a man named Saul, for he is praying. And again, Ananias immediately says, he starts arguing with God. He says, God, don't you know what kind of man this is? But you know, it's a wonderful answer that God gave to Ananias in verse 15. He says to him, the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings. And this man who had caused so much damage to the church of Christ now was a man of God. And his weakness, weakness at times, because he mentioned that himself often, but he was just a man like Elijah, just like you and I, subject to like passions like you and I. And then I also mentioned at the time of Peter, remember Peter was told to go with the men Cornelius had sent. He was to go to speak to them. He went and spoke to them. And the Spirit says in verse 19 of Acts 10, go with these men, go to speak to Cornelius. And when he went before Cornelius, we're told in verse 25, that when Cornelius met him, he fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And uh, Peter immediately says, no, no, I'm only a man. Now, this comes out quite a lot in Scripture. I'm only a man like yourself. Stand up, he says, I myself are only a man. You see, he was a man subject to like passions as you and I. He was only a man. He had weaknesses. He had failings. But he still eventually did a great work for God. He had denied the Lord three times. He had failings. He had lost his faith when walking in the water. Remember Matthew chapter 14. And remember also when the authorities came to apprehend Jesus, eh, Peter was the one that used a bit of violence. He lost his temper a bit, but he was only a man. But God used him. And God heard these prayers as the years went on and as he did a mighty work for God in his lifetime. But I'm trying to point out, it was a man subject to like passions as you and I. And King David was called a man after God's own heart. But when we look at it in Scripture, we realize it was only a man. He had failings. He failed at times. He had weaknesses. He had weaknesses of the lust of the flesh when he committed adultery. But you see, he repented much and God forgave him and he did a mighty work for God. But he was only a man subject to like passions like you and I. Now the reason I mentioned that was 
all these biblical characters I'd mentioned the last time, and some I've first some I've mentioned for the first time, they showed one thing, they showed their failures, but they showed that failure should not failure should not be fatal. The failures were not fatal, and they carried on and did a mighty work for God. You know, in the heroes of faith and he liked Hebrews chapter 11. Many of these people blew it. Name after name, you read them. These men mentioned that what great works for God, but they were subject to failings. For in, in he, Hebrew 11, it speaks of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Rahab, Gideon, Samson, etc. And it goes on and on, great men of God. But if you look at their lives, they had failings. They were men like you and I. And sometimes when we come into the house of God and sometimes in our Christian life, we sometimes feel we've got to be perfect. We'll never be perfect. There's only one perfect. That was Christ. We're perfect in God's eyes. Praise God. Because we're clad in his righteousness. And because we're clad in his righteousness and because we come to God in the name of Jesus and that mighty name which is above every name, because we come in his name, then God does hear us. We come through the blood of Jesus. We come through the covenant. We're God's covenant people. So when we come into a place of prayer, you see, sometimes the saints, we can come in and our head can go down. We've maybe had a bad day or a bad week, and we feel, I'm not good enough. I can't pray among these people. And I've pointed out some of these men and the hearers of faith with all their failings. Men subject to like passion as you are, as I mentioned the last time, yet who through faith subdued kingdoms, remember, brought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions. We're told that milk at a lovely chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. You see, as a blood washed people, we come tonight to pray for a God for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. We don't pray in our own strength and our own goodness, and we don't say, well, maybe we had a bad day. Maybe you had a bad yesterday or a bad day before, but you come tonight believing God, trusting God, that God will hear in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, tonight, we can likewise, like those mentioned in Hebrews 11, we can stop the lion's mouths as well. That's Satan, of course. We can stop Satan and we can pray. You see, God, our Savior, is all about redemption. He's redeemed us. We're redeemed when we're saved. We're redeemed for time and for eternity. Oh, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. And sometimes I say, God's people, their head goes down. But remember, we're saved by grace. Wonderful, free, and sovereign grace. You're a child of God. We all come from various backgrounds. We're all various. We have got various degrees of intelligence. There's no doubt about it. I'm not putting myself at the top, by the way, anything but. I'm probably at the bottom. But God loves us. He loves each one and never let the head go down and say, oh, I'm young, or I'm too old, or I'm not. No, no, no. You come and you lift your voice. And you lift your voice in prayer to pray for this mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Look to him who is the author and finisher of our faith. Why do we read the scriptures before a prayer meeting, especially it's Friday night? We read and expound the scriptures. Is it, is it to hear ourselves preach? No, I can sure you know anything but. It's to sow us through the word of God that you'll be blessed with a few thoughts, the few words, the few scriptures that God will try and show you as the preacher tries his best to show you what God will hear you. And God will answer you. God answers prayer. I'll be in his time, but he does answer prayer. We, we preach so as the words of God will encourage you and also encourage yourself.
So going back to James 5 and 7 again, Elijah was a man subject to like failings like you and I. He was a man with failings. And God heard his prayer and God acted accordingly. And we look at Elijah and say, that was some man of God. But when you look at his life, you realize there was failing. There was times when he could have did things differently. We know that. There were things when we can do things differently. But remember, we're here to pray. Elijah's faith ultimately heard the sound of abundance of rain. Does your faith tonight hear the sound of abundance of rain? The hymn says there's a sound of abundance of rain. There's a sound of abundance of rain. To God we draw near, and by faith we can hear. There's a sound of abundance of rain. To, to each may the faith of Elijah be given to pray till the answer we gain. And sinners acknowledge the witness of heaven and the sound of abundance of rain. Oh, hallelujah. You know, going back to Hebrews 11, the heroes of faith, I mentioned them. Subdued kingdom, that was Joshua, wasn't it? It says also oh, subdued kingdom, Joshua, wrought righteousness, David, obtained promises, Sarah, Hannah, prayed for children. They, were, they got children in their old age, stopped the mouth of lions, Daniel. It says, quench the fire. We could say that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Men believe in God. Now, when we go over these heroes of faith, it does something to us. We look and we realize, we look into our lives, they were men like you and I. Men subject to failings. Now, I am, I'll, I'll labor this point, because sometimes it can get us down if we had a bad day or a bad week, or even a bad last week. But we come to God, we repent of these things, we get under the blood, and we come to God in prayer. And we storm the gates of heaven as a God's people. Now, there's only 16 or 17 or something here today, but we've come to pray for revival, that God will move in power. When I, real, when I see the state of the world, we know what's happened with this war in uh, Europe. The state of the world, the terrible atrocities that take place, how we need God to move. And it's God's people. It's you and I and others like us who will storm the gates of heaven, who will make sure. You see, these people I looked at and heroes of faith and others, they seen something afar off. They seen something from afar, but they see the reality. And like Abraham, they confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on earth, and so are we were strangers and pilgrims of this world. Brothers and sisters, this world is not, is not our home. We're going to glory, but while we're here, we're here as individuals, blood-washed believers, blood-washed born-again Christians, with an access to heaven through the blood, through the person of Christ, an access to heaven, that's tremendous. That's a great a responsibility and a great privilege that we've got access to heaven. And tonight, we've got access to heaven. To storm the gates of heaven. And all we see, we're, we often say the saying, we're pilgrims bound for glory, but so we are. But while we're in this scene of time, then we've got to look upwards and look around us and see there's a great need. There's a great need of revival in the city of Glasgow. You know, faith can rise above your circumstances tonight. Now, I know some of you have felt your circumstances have got on top of you, and what heart goes out to you, we realize that, but we try to show you through the Word that your faith can rise above these circumstances. You know, I seen a program the other day, wife and I watched it. It was quite tragic. It was children, babies dying, 
Some die before birth, some die just after birth. Maybe somebody's seen it. And some particular hospitals were getting the blame. And fair enough, they were blamed because the proper care wasn't there. And when he spoke to the parents, and the parents after the child had died, if you'd see the parents were bitter and understandable. But I says to Joe, no one thing you see, listen to them all. As far as I could see, none of them knew the Lord. Because when you know the Lord and some great tragedies come upon you, then you just totally trust him and say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. So brothers and sisters, irrespective of what's happened in our lives, let's trust him. And especially tonight, repeating myself, as a blood-bought people of God, let us stir them in the gates of heaven. You know, nothing can separate us from the love of God, as Romans 8 says. Nothing at all. Life, death, angels, principalities. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we come to pray tonight. We come as born-again Christians, washed in the blood. Our failings, yes. You say, but John, you don't know my failings. Well, you don't know mine. But we've got failings. But we come in the person of Jesus to pray for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now, I'm going to come down and pray, but I'm just going to ask, Jack was telling me something about the missionaries to Israel that we support, and if they're having problems, I'm going to ask Jack, because I'll probably forget what he told me. I'll ask Jack to speak to us first, so is, and then I'll pray. So Jack will know what one of the things we can pray for tonight is to do the, the war in uh, Europe. And God's people are being affected. And it's, especially it's the group of some of the people we pray for. So if Jack, take, if you take, take a few minutes, Jack, and then after you say that, I'll then start the prayer meeting off.